Hey, and welcome to the Intact Beyond uh, web transformation season. My name is Nathan Dale. I'm the CEO of Intact Beyond. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're a collective of subject matter experts who have all come together to help communities get through this time and thrive beyond. Our facilitator today is Nicole Watson, and our expert is the CEO of community, Melissa Marsden. Melissa focuses on space planning and how the workplace influences how you work, uh, looks at areas such as motivation within the workspace, uh, your values and how they're presented, how your personal brand is presented working from home, and how we use our communities, uh, our workspace and our communities, how they integrate together and how that shift is now happening with what we're all going through. Uh, so I'll hand it over and I hope you enjoy. Thanks again for joining us. My name's Nicole Watson and I'll be facilitating today's deep dive with Melissa Marsden from Community into the physical environment at home. Hi Mel, how are you? I'm well, thanks Nicole. How are you going? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so much for coming today um, and supporting. Um, look, I just wanted to um, start opening up. You know, many employees have been forced to, to work from home and I'm sure things are, are no different for, for you. Um, how has this time impacted your situation? Uh, look, Nicole, it's been a really interesting time for us. Fortunately, we were already set up for um, remote working from the very beginning. So we um, had all the correct technology and systems in place to enable that. But what we've really, really missed is that physical interaction by being able to connect with each other in the office and have the opportunity to brainstorm and collaborate. So we've had to be really creative in trying to find new ways to do that. So that's probably been the biggest challenge for us is that lack of social interaction. And, uh, and now we've got homeschooling on top of that. So there's some really interesting um, dynamics that are happening in our house, that's for sure. Definitely. I know there are lots of distractions happening at the moment. You know, we're, we're all in the same situation. So I'm excited to learn about, you know, how you might be able to, to, to assist with this. So what I'd love to talk to you about, Nicole, today is the fact that we have a very specific way in terms of how our corporate workplaces are created. And I want to unveil some of those philosophies and principles so that we can look at how we can create a really dynamic and optimised working at home environment. So we specialise in the place of employee experience, and that's talking about our offline, which is our corporate work environment, our online, which is everything from Zoom and Teams and all of our virtual environments, through to now we've got our home environment. So we need to look at how our employee experience is being translated through all of those particular environments. So the role of a designer, we worked with people, technology and place to create an experience. And when we take that through into a work environment, what we're doing is we're really taking that people and that experience to create a people experience. And we're coupling that with technology and place to facilitate and construct that particular environment. And when we look at those three environments in terms of our work, what we're really looking at is culture. So people and experience is really about culture. And that's one of the three environments that come together to really create our work environments. What I want to introduce you to, though, is this concept of Ikigai. So Ikigai is a Japanese philosophy, which is a meaning for reason for being. So in Japanese um, culture, everyone has a reason for being, and that's what they describe as being their Ikigai. And it's made up of four spheres. And those four spheres, where they intersect, at the very centre of that is your Ikigai. And by having those four spheres in balance and alignment is when you can actually feel like you're living your Ikigai. So those four spheres cover what we love, what the world needs, what we can be paid for and what we're good at. And when we're living in perfect harmony, we're living in our Ikigai. But if anything is feeling a little bit out of misalignment in our life, it can be usually found that it's one of these spheres is not being fulfilled. So if we're doing what we love and what the world needs, we're fulfilling our mission in life. And that means that we might have delight and fullness, but we're without pay. Now, an example of that is that you might be volunteering in Africa to help build um, you know, schools for disadvantaged children. However, that's not a sustainable um, long-term ability unless you've got another way of finding funds to be able to, to sustain that in a longer term. And the same goes for different elements of your life. So if you're looking at where you're probably out of alignment, this is a really good way of helping you identify that. So that's helping you really connect in with your purpose. And the reason that this is important is because that when we are living in alignment with our purpose and it's infiltrating all of those spheres in our, um, 
in those environments, we're really getting a really holistic experience in our workplace environments. So our people experience is facilitated through a brand led culture. Our technology is our online sphere and our place is our offline sphere. But what we've got at the moment is with the recent pandemic is that our workplace, our offline has actually split. So we've got a work environment and we've also got a home environment. So that's really added a whole other layer of complexity to how we're operating. And we don't have as much control over the home environment as we do as in our workplaces. So what I want to try and do is unveil some of those things so that you can see and bring those to your own home. Now, why is this all so important and why is it important to me as an individual? Well, when we have purpose in our lives and we are living in alignment with our purpose, we can start to feel much more fulfilled. And when that purpose is being infiltrated through all of our offline, our brand and culture and our online experience, we're really creating a very holistic and positive experience. And when that's happening, we're feeling far more engaged. And the impact of that is that when we feel engaged, we know that through our research, we found you have enhanced job satisfaction, you're happier, you're healthier, you're much more creative and innovative, you have a feeling of growth, you feel valuable, you have stronger team relationships and you feel much more productive. So if we can create an environment that makes you feel connected back to your purpose and that you're more engaged, we're able going then to actually feel much more fulfilled in our own personal lives. And a lot of that comes down to how we look at that from an environmental perspective. So, um, look, I think some some things that are key for me there um, is the purpose piece. Um, as, you, as you know, I come from a, a recruitment background and, you know, we talk a lot about the employee experience and the employee value proposition. Um, we, um, we know that purpose plays such a key part in productivity and happiness. You know, we spend 80% of our waking lives. Um, you know, at work. So it, it's really important that we are connected, um, you know, with that purpose um, and, and that we're happy, um, you know, in, in that environment. And I know that, you know, that's what a lot of people are are craving, um, you know, at the moment is that connectivity, um, you, you know, with, with, our, with our colleagues um, back to our environment. Um, and I guess, you know, some of the things that we, um, that we didn't get um, from an office environment in terms of, you know, being able to, to personalize that, we have that now, but we're really lacking that connectivity in with our in with the outer team. Yeah, most definitely. And so when we look at how that comes together from an environmental perspective, we look at it in there's four particular ways. So the first one is around inspiring you. So the space should really inspire us and it should motivate us. The second is around our brand and culture. So our spaces should be a reflection of our brand and they should actually lead our culture. There's also then the piece around values. So when we're reflecting our values, they can influence our behavior. And then there's also a bit around community. So how we shape our sense of community and that impact that it actually has on our well-being. So if we start with talking about how our workplaces inspire us, I want people to feel excited about coming to work every day. It shouldn't be they actually want to go to rather than feeling like they have to. So the space should actually remind them of why they do what they do, why they work for this particular company over another company. If I've got the same set of skills that I can apply to company A and to company B, what makes me want to work for company A? There usually is an alignment there about the purpose of the organisation, the type of clients that they work with. There's a deeper um, intrinsic purpose that is built into that organization and it's about reflecting that so that I'm feeling inspired and connected back into that environment we want people to be proud of it we want to be motivated by it and we want to be able to bring people in and show it off and um, and you know be excited and proud of the place that we actually work for, for sure we should feel the same way about working at home and so what we've started to look at is how we can inspire ourselves to feel motivated about jumping out of bed every day and going into our work environment. So we really think that a home base is an important aspect and using your whole home is also just as important. And I'll take you through all of the principles on that very shortly. So I want you to feel energized to get up and start your day and by reminding you who you work for and who you work with. So one idea that we've gotten and we've implemented in our team is creating a mood board that connects you back to the organization. So imagery and pictures of the brand um, and the organization that you work for, pictures of your colleagues, um, pictures of your clients. Who is it that you're there to serve and how can you connect yourself back into it? 
but also styling that space so that it's visually stimulating for yourself. You know, having your favorite coffee cup there, having some books that you particularly like, maybe it's flowers or plants as well, but creating a sense of space there that is unique to you and that you feel enjoy and enjoy actually being in. It's somewhere that should really connect back to you. And I think that having, if you don't want to put particularly flowers in your space, plants are another really great way of connecting you back to nature. Having great natural light in that space is also helpful to connect you into what's going on in the outside world. And, you know, just making sure that it's a space that's as decluttered as possible. Limit the amount of visual noise that is um, coming into that space. And then think about if you can't get a particular um, space that's just a room just for you, how can you create visual screening in that area using bookcases or screens? So even if it's just the monitor um, connecting you to the rest of everything else, is just screening that off so that you haven't got that visual distraction happening. Another one that we've been working with as well is bringing in candles or even turning on your oil diffuser. That sense of smell and connecting you into that also helps to transition you into a work mode. So what are the signals that you can be giving to your body to help you transition and make that mental shift from, you know, being at home to actually then being at work? No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I'm a very visual person myself. Um, so um, for my setup, um, you know, we're my partner and I live at home, so we're kind of you know flitting between the, the dining table and, and a spare room, but I've made sure that whatever space I do choose, that there is, you know, something there that is going to inspire me. So I make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm facing outside, um, you know, I'm, I'm an outdoorsy person. So it, that makes me feel very free. It gives me that inspiration. It, it lets my creative brain, um, you know, kind of flow. Um, but, you know, likewise, um, you know, I have um, memorabilia and things like that from, from work and I have um, not necessarily pictures of my clients, but I do have them pinned to my desktop so that it does, you know, connect me back um, and give me that grounding um, from a work perspective. Yeah, I think it's a really important thing to do is just to have that visual connection around what it is that you do and why you work for that particular organisation, because it just helps remind you and connect you back in on a, in a visual way when we can't actually do it in a physical way. Definitely, because we don't have those visual cues, you know, when we're walking into the office and, and, and you know, you get the smells and, and you know, you get your, your coffee as you walk in and you've got that smell and it, and it all kind of triggers your brain, doesn't it, to, to, to gear you up for, for, for work for the day. So if we don't have those, we need to introduce those into our home environment. And look, that actually brings us great into brand and culture, because what we want to look at with the brand of an organisation is understanding how that purpose actually translates then into the brand and then how it can actually lead our culture. So in a corporate work environment, I'm going to use Hall Chadwick as an example here. These guys were founded in Longreach 40 years ago. The majority of their clients are still Western Queensland rural agricultural clients. Many of the directors were actually born and bred in Western Queensland as well. So those country values run deep in this organisation. And we really wanted to bring them to the forefront so that when you walked into this space, it felt like them. It smelt like them. It looked like them. When you touch things, it feels like them. So those things are really important visual cues. But we also then can look at how we connect people into that space to represent what that means from a cultural perspective. So when we talk about brand leading culture, it's about understanding what is important to us from a purpose level. How does that then inform our brand? And what does that then play out in terms of our culture? And so when we went into this space, we wanted them to really connect into that. So everything down to some of the detailing, you've got horse bit buckles on the leather backrest there in the kitchen, um, the kitchen banquette. So there's all these little subtle visual cues that really connect you back into who they are as an organisation and what's important to them. And that's that brand alignment piece. And what's important about that is when we look at it, the transition of how that brand then infuses into our culture. So by having understanding of what our purpose is, we can then infuse our brand with that. And so we then take that brand into our organisation. We create an environment that looks and feels and breathes like that brand. And then what that does is it actually leads and creates our culture. And it's our culture then that actually gets radiated back out of our business. And I know the Bob team are very much about this in terms of talking about a brand-led culture, and no doubt they're going to talk about this in a great more detail. But what 
I want to talk about is how this then translates to you personally. So this is in our corporate world, but how do we then take that into our offline home environment? Well, quite simply, it's around what is your personal brand? This is your opportunity to really reflect who you are um, and what you stand for, what's of interest to you and all those personality traits. We've gone about sort of, um, you know, depersonalizing our workplace environments. This is your opportunity to really personalize who you are and give people an insight into what you're interested in, what motivates you, what really lights you up by giving people that little look behind the curtains in a way. So you might have a very industrial um, looking home, use that and communicate to people what you're interested in. Maybe you're quite artistic. So having your art hanging on the wall or you know displaying some of your sketches or being inspired by some of those things. Maybe you're quite feminine. So having those softer touches, perhaps you're a bit more masculine or maybe you're even a musician. It's about actually then communicating who you are with little insights into your personal style. Another key tip on this is around your personal brand. So how you show up in the real world is really how you should be showing up in the online world. So the way that you dress, the way that you do your hair, the way that you carry yourself, all of those things should then transfer over into your online presence. So some of those things are, you know, show up exactly how you do from the offline into the online. Um, consider what your background is communicating about you. Um, my background here is I love to paint and I love plants. So they're things that I've been able to bring into my personal background. Um, if you don't have the ability to create a beautiful real-time background, there are so many options online now to create great virtual backgrounds. And here's just an example of how that can translate. But if you are fortunate enough to have some of that real time space, think about what it is that you, um, you, know, you really enjoy or what's something a little insight into you that other people might know about. Maybe you do have a really beautifully designed home and you've got a fantastic book collection and a beautifully styled bookcase. Maybe you're into cooking and you have a fabulous kitchen or maybe you're into collecting items and you can give people a little insight into all of those collectibles that you've been putting away. The other things that we want to consider are how we actually set our cameras up and how we position ourselves to the screen when we're communicating over Zoom or Teams or any of those other things, because those things are really important in communicating our physical presence, because we can't read body language anymore, where all everything's happening across the screen. So camera position is a really good one. Make sure that your camera's sort of popped up and you've got it on the right height, that you've got the appropriate levels of lighting happening, that your background's considered, you don't want to be having clutter and mess and those sorts of things happening in the background, but also that you're making eye contact at the right level too and that you're not looking down or looking off into the other screens is really interacting with people because we can't have that physical eye to eye contact because we're not in person anymore. We need to try and replicate that to the best we possibly can. Now with your online setup, it does not need to be fancy. This is exactly what I'm looking at now on the other side of this screen, which is what you can't see. But my computer, my laptop is chalked up on a couple of reams of paper in a box. I've got luckily two screens, which makes my life very easy. But in terms of my lighting setup, like it doesn't need to be fancy. I literally have a, desk, a, a bedside lamp and a desk lamp that actually has a piece of baking paper put over it because it's too bright and it glares in my eyes. <laughs> so whatever works, just set it up to the best of your ability and use what you have. Fantastic. Thanks, Mel. Um, you've definitely got my mind thinking about, you know, how I show up on screen, you know, where my camera is positioned. Um, definitely some, some great tips for me. Um, I think one of the key takeouts there is also, um, you know, it, it's true. How often do we get to really express who we are and our personal brand, you know, and, and give um, our, our clients, our, our customers and, and our network um, a slice of our home life? Um, you know, it, it is so rare. So I think it's a great opportunity to, to really go out there um, and express yourself. Have you got any advice around, um, you know, the do's and the don'ts around that at all? Um, look, I think it's really important to put um, put yourself out there a little bit more than we have previously. And the things that you would have had on your desk at work is maybe they're the things that you want to have um, either in front of you or behind you in terms of communicating. But I think it's also just really important that you get up and you show up every day in the way that you did offline um, in the same way that you can do with that online. Fantastic. Thank you.
So we then spoke about values. Now, when we talk about values, they are the, um, the elements that actually live inside our culture. So what do we value as an organisation? What is important to us? Now, values can sometimes get a little bit construed, but if you break it down, it's really just what are we valuing as an organisation? What do we stand for? That's exactly what values are. So when we look at that, we actually then can articulate what it is to be living in alignment with those values. And that's how we describe our behaviour. So I'll pick on a really easy one. If we want to be collaborative, and that's one of our values, what does that actually look like from a behavioural perspective? Usually it means that we're problem solving together, that we're communicating as a team, that we're coming together and we're working through issues and we're solving things and we're quite collegiate. So that's a really simple example of how a value then defines a behaviour. So when we understand what the values are for an organisation, we can then determine what those behaviours are and we then can start to positively influence those behaviours and how we create the physical environment. Now, what we're probably experiencing quite a bit of at the moment is just general fatigue and energy depletion. And a lot of that is because we're having to physically think about the things that were previously quite natural because all of the physical environment and our routine was cued in a way that we didn't actually have to think about it. All of these things became unconscious. Whereas now we don't have those physical um, stimulus and we don't have that routine of getting up in the morning and commuting to work and arriving at our workplace. We're having to actually physically think about these processes and making those mental shifts quite consciously from those different environments. So when we look at this from a corporate perspective, we look at flow. So flow is around the sequence of activities, what we do in what order and when, and it's all about our routine. We talk about spaces. So different furniture actually creates various postures and work settings. So if you think about it from the concept of activity-based working, it really is that. It's about creating a space that creates an opportunity to do a particular activity and perform a specific task. It's a different posture and it also brings a different physical energy to it. So it's about shifting up our working modes. And then the last one we look at is our zoning. How do we arrange our spaces and what do they do in relation to one another? So quiet spaces versus noisy spaces and collaborative spaces. It's about looking at how all of those elements come together in an environment. So if we look at values first up, What's important for us to really consider is maintaining all of our work rituals. So morning meetups, um, you know, coffee runs with our, our colleagues, Friday afternoon drinks, birthday celebrations, really maintaining that um, those rituals now that we're um, a distributed workforce and just finding new and creative ways to do that. But also starting new work rituals. Now, in our workplace environments, we create environments where people can come together and often described as serendipitous moments. What we're having to do at the moment is be really deliberate and quite conscious around creating those moments. So what I'm calling it is structured serendipity. We need to schedule in things to make sure that they happen. So we need to schedule our coffee catch up so that they still continue to happen because your colleague might not be available at the time that you just decide you want to have a coffee because you can't see them. You want to potentially start doing a walking daily huddle to check in in the morning and set your day's priorities. We've started doing a daily debrief as well. And that debrief is a bit more of a wellbeing call just to check in and go, how was your day? How are you coping? What's your energy levels like? How are you, how are you feeling about things? What can we do to help? We've introduced stretch sessions and we've just done one today and we do that over Zoom. So we grab a YouTube video, a Pilates session or a yoga session and we do that as a team to really get us up and moving, but also to connect in and have a bit of fun. And just, just getting up and moving around the house is really important as well. But it's also important to maintain some of your personal rituals. So like get out of bed, get up, have breakfast, have a shower, do those things, but then also look at starting new personal routines and rituals. So this is a real great opportunity for you to shake up things and how you're doing things, you know, because what worked in the nine to five work day is probably not going to work for you right now. Things are different. Your routines can be quite different. Perhaps you want to get up and play with the kids for a couple of hours in the morning and then get stuck into your day. Maybe you want to go for a run at lunchtime. All of these things are up for negotiation at the moment so that you can find the best thing that's going to work for you because the routine that you had prescribed to you in your corporate work environment is, um, is shifted. If we talk then about our spaces, 
When I mentioned before about how our spaces create different tasks and activities, there's essentially five of them. We all have our, our home base, our work area, but then we also have our quiet spaces, our collaboration spaces, we have the ability to stand, we have spaces that are for lounging and relaxing, and we also don't have those bump spaces. So as I spoke about those serendipitous moments, they're all engineered into your work environment so that you will interact with other people. So if we then look at how we can create those things at home, what we're then enabling us to do is to connect into different work modalities, to bring different energy to different tasks and to shift our posture throughout the day. So everything that you've heard about working from home, I'm throwing out that old rule book, it's gone. So, you know, they used to tell you, find a desk in a room, close the door, have no distractions. If you locked me in a box for a day, I go completely balmy. So the idea is that you use your whole home and I'm gonna show you how. So what does it look like at work first? So let me just give you something that you might be able to connect to from a working environment. So the first thing is around collaborative spaces. So every business is going to be different. Your business might be very collaborative. You might actually be on the converse of that and be quite individual. So when we design a corporate work environment, we look at the range of spaces that we need and we work out the best ratio to help guide the values of the organisation. So again, what are the behaviours we want to see? And then how do we align that and guide that through the spaces that are provided? So if we want to have a very collaborative work environment, we provide a lot more collaboration spaces because it gives people that physical cue that they want you want to be interactive, that's going to work for the organisation and what kind of goals and um, purpose they're trying to achieve. So there's two examples there on the screen, you know, it might be a collaborative whiteboard setting or it might be digital and you're all coming together around a piece of furniture. You might be a more individual type of working and you have um, workstations and you've got your stand up desks here. Maybe you've got a kitchen area where you can all come together and it's again having the opportunity to have a coffee, have a meeting with another colleague. And then there's the other spaces there around having the ability to have a quiet coffee in a lounge area so it's a bit more intimate and a bit more relaxed or then being able to collaborate in that other area. But the idea of having these different spaces is also enabling people to move around and have that physical activity through the day. We're not sitting stagnant, we're getting up and we're moving. So even if you think about your standard work day, you'll come in, you might go and grab a coffee with your colleague, you might go out for, for lunch. Um, you'll be moving into a meeting room to have a different meeting. You're not sitting in front of your screen all day, which is what we're doing now, because our meetings are one after the other on the screen. We're not having that ability to physically get up and move. So we've got to look for other ways to be able to do that. So what does that look like for us at home? So at work, you might have your offline, um, your general work desk. So this is where your home base is and this is where you get the majority of your work done. At home, that might be set up at the kitchen table. You might be lucky enough to have that office space and you can implement all of those beautiful things about styling it and doing your mood board. But even if you can't do that, creating some of those physical cues around you at your home base is going to be important to helping you shift into that mindset of actually working. And then we look at what it was happening on our online. So we're looking at using Zooms, potentially you've got Teams, other tools such as Basecamp, Paper, Miro, there's a variety of online tools and that can help facilitate our working environment. So, you know, as a, an example, you know, having that clean desk, clutter free, bringing in your plants, having your candle, having your vision board there, just really connecting back into who you are and what you're trying to do and, and who it is that you're working for. Some really simple ergonomic tips is always helpful as well. So your desk should be around 700 millimetres high. Your elbow should be at 90 degrees to the desktop. If you want to know exactly where to put your screen, if you extend your arm out parallel, the centre of the screen should be at the centre at the end of your fingertips. When that centre of the screen is the end of your fingertips, it's at the right distance and height for your eyes and to not cause any eye fatigue and also neck pain. If you're going to be standing, again, 90 degrees for your elbow, really simple tips um, and then your ergonomics don't need to get too convoluted. We also then look at what our bump spaces are. So a bump space in a corporate environment is typically the cafe um, and the kitchen, wherever the coffee machine is generally, because that's the space that we all kind of want to congregate to. So the activities that we would then have in that space is we're running into colleagues, we're having a chat um, and we're just really having that informal banter. 
The way that we can replicate that at home is to have those conversations in our kitchen. So if we're having a just a general morning catch up or connecting with our team for a coffee over Zoom, we can do that out of our kitchen and just changing up that um, atmosphere and that background and the feeling of that space for ourselves. But then also think about how you can switch up your technology and even just using different devices. So rather than carrying your laptop around the whole house, perhaps what you're doing is actually connecting in on your phone and doing a FaceTime call. Maybe you're having a chat through WhatsApp or on Teams or in Slack. There's so many different ways that you can connect that don't always require you being face-to-face -face on your laptop. Our collaboration spaces are spaces that are usually a table with enough space to seat six or so people around it. You've probably got a whiteboard and the ability to communicate and brainstorm. At home, the closest comparable space that you've got for that is usually going to be your dining table because it's got multiple settings, it's got a large surface, you can spread things out and you can start to really work through your problems and just the way that you would in, an, in a corporate environment. Again, online, looking at collaboration tools that enable you to communicate and connect with people such as Zoom and Teams and Basecamp, Paper, Mirror. I mean, these are only just a few examples of what's available out there. You need to find what's gonna work for you and for your organization, but just exploring that and looking for different and new opportunities. Outstanding spaces in our work environments are also a great opportunity for us to get up and move. When we're standing, we're actually starting to boost our metabolism because it's enabling us to shift some of those blood glucose levels, which helps to start to weight off that, um, that afternoon lethargy that we start to feel. So potentially what you could do at home is go outside and go for a walk, have a phone call, have a FaceTime call, but get active, take the dog down to the park and have that conversation in that space. But just thinking about things in, in a different way. The lounging spaces at work are a great space for us to sort of sit back and relax and have a casual conversation with a colleague or to work informally. At home, the same could be done in, a, in your lounge room. You know, perhaps you've got the kids around, so maybe you're going to have a phone call or a FaceTime call, or you maybe just want to be sitting there and reading a document. But it's about looking at different spaces in your home and how you can use them to create different activities and shift that mental energy that comes with every particular activity. Same thing with a quiet space. So a quiet space is usually a space that you wanna work in solitude. You don't wanna have distractions from your phone, um, usually not having other people around. And it's really an opportunity to sort of decompress and find that downtime. I find that the bedroom is a great place for that because it's that similar mental energy that you're bringing from um, you know, that relaxation mindset. A lot of people will say, don't work in your bedroom. You won't be able to switch off at night. It's going to be hard to sleep. And that may be true for some people. I actually find my bedroom one of my most creative spaces. I love sitting cross-legged on the bed, spreading all my stuff out and just working through things with pen and paper. I just find that a really creative energy for me. So I think it's about finding what's going to work for you and then looking at how you can implement that and bring that through into your day. The quiet space in the office, again, might be a quiet room where you can sit and have an informal but private conversation with a colleague. Again, find another space in your home that enables you to do that and just look at all of those different opportunities that you've got. So really the message is here is use your whole home, throw out that old rule book where you're just confined to your study and look at different ways that you can use your home. So the kitchen can be a great place for you to have those bump style interaction conversations. The dining table is great for collaboration, going outside and going for a walk to get your standing or even just using your laptop at the, at the kitchen bench because it's at a more appropriate height. Looking at the bedroom and the lounge room as a space for you to be able to sort of have those lounging and decompressing and then also the bedroom for that really quiet opportunity. Now look, what I've shown you here is all very um, idealistic. A lot of it is the philosophy and how you can start to think and shift some of that stuff. And I appreciate that that's not gonna be the reality for so many people, but it's about taking some of these ideas and concepts and applying them wherever possible. This guy, a couple of months or years ago now, he sort of kind of revolutionised the whole working at home and being busted in and by your children. I appreciate that most people are going to have their kids at home, homeschooling them. I know I do. You've probably heard them in the background screaming and at various points through this um, today. But it's about just finding what works for you. And, you know, we know that life is not always going to be perfect. You may have had a three-year-old tornado just go through your house and they've finally crashed out. You're not going to clean that up. You're going to go and get two hours of solid work done before they wake up. 
perhaps it's entertaining your poor little baby as they sit in the high chair and eat an orange while you get some work done after your house has just been completely destroyed by them. Or maybe you just have to stick the wiggles on for a little while while you can get that Zoom call done or they have to join you for the Zoom call. So look, I appreciate it's going to be different for everyone and it really is about finding what works for you, but it's also about shifting that mindset and thinking creatively about how can we use different parts of our home to achieve different outcomes. Fantastic. Thanks, Mo. I mean, for, for me personally, I, I've definitely tried to switch up the devices that I've been using. Um, but in terms of the spacing in our, our small apartment, you know, we, we have been switching between the dining table and the spare room, but we haven't thought to, you know, maybe utilize the balcony or maybe, you know, sit on the lounge or, or maybe to, to take that, you know, to have that quiet time um, in the bedroom, you know, if you're working on some paperwork or something that really does require your full attention. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I, I can't wait to sit down with my partner and try and work out a bit of a schedule. Um, you know, also touching upon, you know, the, the other people that you share your space with as well. I mean, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to, to live on their own. And as you mentioned, we, we, everyone's got, you know, kids and, and dogs and, and cats and, and, and distractions left, right and centre. So how would you um, maybe suggest, um, you know, kind of having that conversation, approaching that conversation with your household about the use of the different space? And would you suggest a, a schedule or, or something like that? Um, that's actually a really interesting question because we're going through that whole process at the moment and you know my husband's having to sit at the kitchen table that was him with our daughter there and you know we've got our daughter at home here with our nanny a couple of days a week we've now got the kids home four days a week oh you know permanently and it's just really trying to find a different way of working so we're actually looking at time blocking and working out so he's got the morning shift I do the afternoon shift with helping the kids from the homeschooling um, and we shift that up if he's got to go to meetings or I've got to go to meetings we kind of work through that as well and then it's just being conscious and respectful of the fact that, you know, he's working as well as I'm working. And it's just about how can we use those different spaces at different times so that we're both getting the best of what we need. Sometimes it's a bit ad hoc, but anything that we know that is pretty scheduled in, we're, we're conscious of sharing that. And so every morning it's kind of like, okay, what have you got on for today? I need to do this. You need to do that. And it's about sort of managing each other's expectations. And now we've had to have this whole other routine applied as well with the homeschooling. So it's about setting the kids up for the day, going through their lesson plan and then kind of working out what they need to do and then being available at key times to be able to sort of provide further input and feedback to them as well. Fantastic. I guess it's like, you know, that startup meeting that you'd have with your colleagues at, at the beginning of every day to work out, you know, what your priorities are and where you're going to be. You kind of have one of those internally um, across the household now, don't you? Yeah, we do. It's a daily huddle for the, for the family team. <laughs> and look, the last thing I want to speak about today is around community. And obviously community is something that's very close to our hearts. It's something that we actually branded our business after. And the reason that we've done that and what we feel really important is with this is that wherever people meet and interact, a community is formed. So those communities are based on shared values, on shared stories, experiences, and they help people to feel like there's a sense of belonging. You know, they're built on a shared vision and it's true sense of connection. And those things are unique in every business. No longer is your where, the place that you live, your community. It used to be the street you lived on, the town you lived in. You know, those things used to define your community. Now your community can be anywhere. And a lot of communities are virtual and online already. So it's about connecting in and understanding what it is that, that drives that community. And that's also where we find that real sense of connection and that sense of purpose around connecting back into our organisations. So if we want to look at how that then translates now that we're in this offline world, we want to try and create different ways for us to really strengthen those relationships and connect back into our communities and remain connected to our teams and to our organisations. So some of the things that we would have done offline um, in our work environments is those collaborative conversations. So the online water cooler, what do we do there? You know, we can't physically just pop down to the cafe now and have a, a, you know, a quick chat in the kitchen over the coffee machine. So what we've got to do is look at new and creative ways that we can do that to replicate that social banter and have that, um, just that ongoing dialogue with our colleagues. You know, we don't have that person sitting next to us and go, oh, you know, you know, what was the latest Netflix binge that you had and, and, and what should I be watching? We need to find different ways to do that. 
So what we've seen happening is WhatsApp channels are being created, dedicated teams and Slack channels specific to different types of conversations. So there might be one for net, Netflix binges. There might be another one for, um, you know, weekend sports or other things like that. Then that are framed around particular interests of the organisation and the people within that. And maybe that's something that as an individual you can lead in terms of the creation of that. It might be an interest that you have and you want to see who else is connected into that. You might find that there's a whole new raft of people that you can connect into in your organisation that you hadn't actually met because of creating something like this. FaceTime calls, we've already mentioned, you know, jumping in and having a FaceTime call with your colleagues um, in the kitchen. But the other one that I've heard that I absolutely love is the creating an all day Zoom room. So basically from eight to five, there's a Zoom room that's open. And whenever you feel like a break, instead of wandering down to the cafe and grabbing a coffee, you jump into the Zoom room and whoever's in there, you can have a chat with them, you can have a coffee, you can do all of those um, things that you would have done in the physical world online. And then when you finish and you've got to go back to work, you just say goodbye and, and off you toddle again. So I think that's a really fantastic example of how to create community in this virtual world. Facebook's been doing it for ages. It's just about how do we then replicate that from a work perspective? And it's all of those similar principles. Collaboration is another big one that actually drives that sense of community. So if we're able to physically collaborate in the um, in the offline work environment, we're doing that with a whiteboard. We're actually standing around or sitting around and we're communicating in a, in a group in a dynamic way. And we're all being able to share ideas and put them into a singular space. The same runs true from an online perspective. So again, having project channels and teams or Slack to be able to share ideas in a more fluid and um, dynamic way, but also then using tools like online whiteboards. Now we're a creative agency as well. We have that ability to collaborate and to communicate ideas. And we've been searching for tools exactly like everyone else in terms of how to do this. One of the great ones that we've found is Miro and there are a lot of others out there like online whiteboards but it gives us that ability to pin our ideas up and really connect in and communicate about what, what it is that we're trying to achieve here. And we can all contribute. We can draw on there, we can pin ideas. And then the other great thing is we can just have a phone call. And when someone else is in there, we can actually see the mouse moving around the screen because it's all in real time. So it's immediate feedback for each of us and we can communicate that way. The other thing that I think is really important about maintaining um, and strengthening our communities through this particular time is having what I, as I mentioned before, is structured serendipity. We don't have that ability to physically bump into people at the moment, so we need to be much more conscious and deliberate about it. The other thing that we found really helpful is looking at how we can structure out our working week so that we can all continue to contribute and connect into that community. So I mentioned before around having structured serendipity and this is exactly what I'm talking about. It's about being very deliberate and very conscious of how we are structuring our work day to ensure that we're all connecting in and that we're all contributing. So we've got this weekly schedule that we run for our team and it's around a weekly team meeting to kick things off on a Monday, which is about maintaining our normal routine and then having our daily huddles. Now, normally those huddles would have been done in person, but now we're doing them over a Teams meeting every morning. We're setting our priorities, we're updating our Asana, and then we know exactly what we've got to achieve for the day. We've also popped in their team coffee dates. We've now got a team stretch session. We have a virtual team lunch once a week. We've just got the open drop-in so we can connect in and communicate with each other. But we've also added in a daily debrief. Now that debrief is just a way for us to connect every day. If, you know, maybe you've been offline all day and you've been really focused on getting some work done. This is just in a way to sort of come up for air and have a chat with your colleagues and sort of then say, good up, say goodbye for the afternoon. So it's about sort of how can we find new and creative ways to really connect in with our community and to strengthen our relationships and really um, emphasise what our purpose is through this whole period of time. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mel. I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have definitely implemented, um, you know, morning um, catch ups every morning and daily check ins. Um, you know, we're often um, touching base at the end of the day, but we haven't thought about, you know, team stretch sessions or, um, or virtual lunches. And I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. We've implemented um, Friday Zoom drinks, and that's just a great opportunity for us to all kind of talk about the successes of the week and, and you know, what's happening, really reconnecting. 
um, you know, in terms of um, team morale, it's been great for our business. Um, you know, we, we are all, all of us, most of us are, are kind of isolated, um, you know, at the moment, and, and some people could, can also be living on their own. So, you know, if you don't have that ability to, to connect in with your colleagues, it can be really tough. So I'm definitely going to be um, taking a look at this schedule and kind of rolling it out to the team because I think there's some fantastic ideas there. I mean, was there anything, um, I guess, that you've put together um, that has worked particularly well for the team? Oh, look, I think the Miro thing has been the most um, successful implementation and find that we've had because that was probably the thing we were struggling with the most, you know, continuing to deliver projects and, and work through those sessions with our clients and be, you know, that strategic collaboration. We didn't have another form of way of sharing those ideas in a in a, a sort of a fluid way and that board has enabled us to do that and we've got four people who are contributing to it so we're all able to have a say and uh, and put our ideas up there but I think also then implementing this structure has been something that has been really good in terms of strengthening our relationships with each other and just making sure that we don't disconnect because sometimes we get wrapped up in what we're all doing but we've now got these reminders and everything is scheduled out in our calendar and we work around those things because if we didn't have that structure there they just wouldn't happen. Definitely. And I guess, you know, it, it's different for, for different industries. I mean, I, I come from a sales background and I can imagine, you know, it's particularly in my younger career when I'm, I need that sales noise around me to, you know, to, to pick up the phone and continue to, to, to have that buzz and to bounce off other people. And that must be really hard to kind of recreate at home. So, you know, maybe having, um, you know, an online session where you all connect in, um, you know, at the same time, you all G each other up and then you feed in at the end of it. That could be a great idea for sales. I see, um, you know, from a whiteboard perspective for um, people in that creative space, the design space, that again is an absolutely um, fantastic idea. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've been struggling as well is just, is that it's being able to bounce ideas off people and they don't always come at the time that you have scheduled for your creativity session. So being able to kind of, you know, log that idea, jot it down somewhere. Um, I think that's a, an absolutely fantastic um, idea. So thank you very much for, for sharing. No problems at all, Nicole. I think they've been really helpful. And I mean, as I said, it's just trial and error and finding what's going to work for you and everyone, every organization and every individual is going to be very different. Um, and look, if anyone wants to get some more information from us on um, any of these options or connect in, we've actually started a Facebook group called Community Dialogue and we'd love people to jump in there, share their challenges, share their wins, um, even just share some of the hacks that they may have found in terms of um, navigating this whole new environment that we're really challenged with at the moment. Um, and then there's some other social channels there as well that we can connect on and, and continue this conversation. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mel. That was going to be my next question. You know, how do people, how do people reach out? How do they get more information? How do they get in touch? So, um, but guys, everything's on the screen. Um, please feel free to, um, to reach out to Mel and, and, and get some further information on how she may be able to, um, to support you. Thanks so much for taking the time to, um, to run through that with us, Mel. Um, I guess, look, um, just to wrap it up, I, I wanted to understand, and, and look, I've asked this, this question to a few people and it's been, um, completely differences of opinion. So I'll, I'll throw it out to, to you. How do you see um, the working community transforming beyond today? Oh, look, I think this is going to be a really exciting time for us. I mean, obviously there's going to be a significant amount of change, but you know, we've been quite jovial about it in the terms of the fact that, you know, what COVID has done overnight, 18 months of change management, often can't actually achieve so you know we've definitely proven that we can work remotely we've proven that the technology can be enabled to do that um, but what we've also seen is that there are challenges worth working remotely like there it's very different we're also working in a very different um, environment at the moment I mean this isn't normal this isn't natural we're all confined to our homes so the challenges that we're presented with in this particular time is very different to what work from home would be on a general day-to-day -day arrangement that you do by choice and then you do it by design. That's not happening to us at the moment. The way that I see this shifting is that, you know, organisations are going to potentially start re-looking at their space, how they're using their workplace environments, 
um, what the opportunities are there to look at different ways of working in the future. But I think what we've also really identified is the real reason that we have a work environment and that's around that social human connection. It's our ability to come together and to solve problems, to innovate and to collaborate and just to connect in as humans. And really it's all about that sense of community. That's exactly what our workplaces are there for. They're not there for us to actually go and work. We can work anywhere. So I think we're gonna be really starting to rethink how we use our corporate workplace environments and what that dynamic looks like in terms of how we're working from home and how those two spaces then blend together and we create a much more holistic experience. Definitely. I mean, I, I know myself, I'm certainly missing my work environment. And I think there are many, many things that I took for granted. Um, you know, whilst uh, there are parts of, um, you know, of working from home that I do really enjoy and, and I do want to, um, you know, to continue with moving forward. You know, there, there are parts that I, I, I wish I could, you know, recreate those conversations in the kitchen. I wish that I had the quiet time, you know, to, to, to tap out that bid or whatever it might be that, that I'm working on. But I think one of the things that's been really fantastic um, and, and, you know, and the silver lining in this time is a lot of businesses have um, really been able to pivot during this time. Um, mm. You know, and when things are tough, it, it can be quite often, you know, doom and gloom and we're in a phase of, panic for such a long period of time whereas what I'm actually seeing across the market is a number of business leaders looking at this as an opportunity and saying okay how can we um, you know do something different what, what you know how can we use this this time as an opportunity for us to succeed as an opportunity for us to really go out there and develop relationships um, and make the most of this time at home whether or not that's from a business perspective but then also on an individual level um, you know, looking internally, looking at, um, you know, the, the family situation and being able to reconnect, um, you know, looking at wellness, looking at spending more time and, and having, you know, meal, meals together, you know, just with your family. I think um, it, it's been on positives and, and negatives, um, you know, th throughout this situation. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's that real opportunity to rethink how we engage with each other, how we engage with our workplaces and looking at what those opportunities are for, for a whole new world of work. Definitely. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Mel. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Nicole. Thank you.